why don't we take a, a moment here to bring any unconfessed sins and um, bring our uh, heart back into a right relationship, claiming the uh, promise of forgiveness that we find in um, 1 John 1, 9. And then we'll get started uh, continuing our, our lesson in uh, Judges. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the provision um, in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you sent, um, that we might be redeemed, that we might be brought to you, Lord. We thank you for the, um, the gift of forgiveness that you offer us, even uh, to the extent that we fail you so often, so cyclically, Lord. Um, thank you for restoring us into a right relationship. Uh, we pray that um, uh, the words that uh, you would have heard would be heard today and that we might apply them to our lives. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll continue with our uh, study as we started to set up last week in the book of Judges, um, but we won't start today in the book of Judges um, because that would just be, uh, you know, too predictable. Uh, so if you've got your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to um, uh, the book of Proverbs and the 14th chapter, and we'll uh, very quickly look at a verse that is, I think, uh, quite um, familiar to most of us. So, Proverbs 14, 12. Some of you may actually have that one memorized. There is a way, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death, okay? Okay. Um, I wanted to start with that verse because of the theme of the book of Judges that we looked at last week, which comes up in the last chapter of the, of the book of Judges, um, when, um, when we find that uh, in Judges 21-25, it says that in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. I think we spent a little bit of time last week, but not a whole lot, talking about it doesn't say uh, that people were doing wrong in their own eyes. It's just what they seem to think uh, was uh, the right way. And then um, the wisest man uh, that ever lived, Solomon, tells us in, in, um, in his description in Proverbs that the way that seems right to a man is the end way to death. Um, but before we get into the book of Judges, got one more stop, and we're going to go to the New Testament. We're going to look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So if you can find your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we will um, look at a few verses here. Um, and I'll stop just short of a verse that uh, we often like to claim, or we should be claiming a lot. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you've made your way there, starting in verse 6, it says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. That comes from the New Testament, okay? And it is a warning to not do as what had historically uh, been done because, as we began to discover last week, sin is never without judgment. Um, sin is abhorrent to God. Sin is a stench in the nostril of God. And we will look a little bit more today at some of the depravity that was going on uh, in the ancient Near East during the time of, uh, of the Judges, what's sometimes referred to as the Dark Ages of the ancient Near East. 
Um, but I did want to continue on because I don't want to just leave you with that. Uh, continuing on in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, we'll look at verse 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. And then verse 13, I think, is the one uh, that many of us claim uh, and should claim as a Bible promise. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will provide you a way out so that you can endure it. Okay? I want to just take a moment to uh, try to imprint in you that phrase, common to mankind. Okay? Um, historians talk about the cycles of history, uh, the doom to repeat history, and I will, uh, my contention is that the uh, most determinative factor in human history, absent God, meaning under the sun, as, um, as we would find in the book of Ecclesiastes, is the fall of man, is the sinful fall of man. It turns everything here on its ears, it, on its head. It um, corrupts um, creation, and that corruption cries out for a redeemer, a redeemer that we have in the God-man, Jesus Christ. But it is common. Sometimes we're going to look at some things that will maybe um, turn your stomach. It turns my stomach. This is actually, I mean, it's beautiful snow out there, and uh, we have a, a, a relatively few folks here today. This would probably be a good Sunday not to be here if you, if you want to uh, avoid hearing just the depravity of mankind. Uh, but uh, I think we need to hear it. Um, because um, it is common to man, and the way that seems right to a man ends in death. Some of you who know me uh, a little bit know that I love to listen to J. Vernon McGee. I think he's, he's awfully cool, and his voice just resonates with me. In fact, I, uh, when, I, when I see his, his prose in written form, I still hear his voice actually saying it. Uh, but um, J. Vernon McGee uh, talks about uh, what he says is the hoop of history. And this is for individuals, okay? Uh, and it's especially, and he's referring to Christian individuals. Um, says it starts by serving and being led by God, okay? Uh, then that which separates us from fellowship enters in sin, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, Although it might be right in our own eyes, okay, when sin enters the picture, uh, we forsake God and we serve our own pleasure. And if we have time, we may look at some of the uh, modern utilitarianism theory uh, that was espoused and I think uh, becoming even more evident in our culture, uh, espoused uh, by Jeremy Bentham a couple centuries ago. Um, so we forsake God and we serve our own pleasure, and that puts us in a position of slavery and servitude. Okay? It does not allow us the abundant joy. It does not allow us to live in freedom as um, it is intended uh, through God's uh, divine plan. Then comes to the point, maybe, hopefully, where the Holy Spirit very quickly convicts us of said sin, and we begin to cry out to God in distress, um, and we turn back to God, um, sometimes through uh, the, the promise of 1 John 1, 9, hopefully through that promise, there is deliverance from that sin and a restoration of right, rightness and righteousness in our relationship with God, and we're back to serving and being led by God, okay? Um, you could almost call that the sin cycle. I prefer to call that the reconciliation cycle, okay, of individuals. But um, J. Vernon McGee didn't stop there, okay, because that was more at an individual level. Um, in one of his lessons, he talks about... Um, the hoop of history as it relates to nations, okay, to uh, 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 congregations of people uh, that are um, uh, uh, living in certain groups, uh, call them nations, call them states, whatever. Um, but um, he uses um, the first chapter of the book of Isaiah to lay out uh, a divine cycle of nations, okay, because you, they generally enter a period of prosperity, okay, um, might even say convenience, excess, 
um, but um, uh, prosperity. Then there is spiritual apostasy uh, that will come in, leading inevitably from behavioral circumstances um, to moral awfulness, okay? He links morality to behaviors, but it can just as easily uh, be um, ascribed to thought processes. So from prosperity to falling away from um, uh, 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 God's plan, uh, which leads, you know, his spiritual apostasy to moral awfulness. Anyone care to guess what his fourth and final cycle is for nations under this? Prosperity, spiritual apostasy, moral awfulness, political anarchy. Political anarchy, okay? And folks, um, we can look at this even from a secular viewpoint. When you go back and look uh, from the Enlightenment period um, forward, you can uh, look at people like Locke and, 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 and realize that without morality, without character, uh, there can be no sustainable political system, okay? It's not happened in the history of recorded mankind, and I don't think that we would see that happen in history future either, okay? So... We look at, and this is a, a verse, verse is very familiar to you. In fact, our pastor has taught on this a, a couple of times in the last a couple of years, and um, it's, it's been fantastic. Uh, you have the promise of Second Chronicles 7, 13 through 14. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear for heaven hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land, okay? Sometimes we like to skip right to that and forget about the fact that there was no rain, there was locusts and plagues, that were, there was a devouring of the land, um, and stuff like that. So, yeah, we must cry out to God, okay? We must cry out to God individually for individual uh, reconciliation and restoration of righteousness through the forgiveness of sin, but... God also works in the cycle of history with nations, and we see that uh, very, very clearly in the book of Judges in the, um, uh, his interventions, repeated interventions with the children of Israel, his people. So the book of Judges, we, we kind of placed it in, in its historical context, looking at uh, the fact that it's you know, 350 to 400 years worth of history, a history that is, uh, I would dare say, not taught at all. Uh, anymore in our uh, at least public education system. Um, and uh, I would say that's okay, but that's not okay. Um, but I would also say that in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, it is purposeful, uh, purposeful neglect. Um, authorship um, and timing of when the book of Judges was written, um, many scholars ascribe this, uh, this particular book to, uh, to Samuel. Okay, We do know that it was written uh, at the earliest portions of the time of the monarchies, the monarchy, so that would be, you know, uh, when, when Saul was anointed. Um, uh, but it would have had to have come pretty quickly after the period of the judges uh, for a lot of this contextual information in here to be, uh, 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 to, to be fully understood. So, uh, you know, we're looking in the, you know, the transitional period between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age in, in human secular history. Uh, uh, we're looking at the timing of the book being written probably at the end of the period of the judges into the earliest portions of, of the Israelite monarchy. Um, but it, it has an interesting name called Judges, okay? <laughs> and so let's take a minute to talk about who are these judges? What are these judges? Now, if I had my PowerPoint up here, I would share with you some of my favorite judges, okay? Um, one of whom I think the best judge that I have seen is Judge Wapner, okay? Um, there, we are talking about a man of incredible discernment, okay, um, who, who brought his uh, system of justice to our television um, uh, when, when I was a youth. And, and I loved Judge Watner, and I especially loved the post-verdict uh, conversations with the litigants 
in that. Was that Dick Llewellyn? Is that who, who, who would interview them as they, as they walked out? Well, what do you think about losing? You know, well, you know, it, it was like, uh, you know, I'm kind of okay with it because I'm probably going to get compensated for my appearance on this, on this show, but uh, I love Judge Watner. Uh, then, I mean, more, uh, I think more contemporary would be Judge Judy, um, uh, who, was, who was a hoot. Um, uh, I would have, uh, should have updated my Supreme Court justice list because there's three of them on my list last time I thought this that are, that are, that are different, but we sometimes think of uh, uh, the Supreme Court, and, um, and some of you might not know this, but, uh, but my uncle, my dad's brother, um, was on, um, on television uh, as a as a judge. Now he's an attorney by 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 tradecraft, uh, but he played a judge on one of these Judge Wapner people's court like shows called Texas Justice. Okay, uh, by Judge Larry Joe Doherty. Okay, and it it was really really cool because you'd have to know my uncle. I I love to watch the introduction of it of him riding a horse with his black cowboy hat. My uncle lived in West University Place, and some of the, <laughs> the <laughs> I'm not sure he'd seen a horse, you know, uh, before he, he got on that. But uh, I used to love to watch my uncle um, dispense Texas justice, you know, on the television shows, okay? Sometimes I'd wonder, is that really my uncle saying that? Uh, but uh, in any event, so, um, so, but these are not the type of judges, okay? Uh, that, that we're talking about when we look at um, uh, this uh, historical book in, in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the word judges comes from the Hebrew word shapat, okay? And we see it over and over again, obviously, in the book of Judges. In uh, chapter 2, 16, 15, 20, we see it again in 1 Samuel come up. The meaning, uh, or the roughly translated meaning to um, at least my Texan uh, vernacular would be to deliver or to rule, okay? Okay. Uh, they would not solely be responsible for delivering uh, verdicts based on established law. Uh, they were spiritually appointed deliverers, okay? They were appointed by God. Uh, they could dispense justice, okay? Uh, that, that did happen. Uh, but they were also in place to vindicate the righteous, okay? We see that in, um, in a reference in Psalms chapter 26, uh, you will also find some of them uh, were, were sent to destroy the wicked, okay? They were, um, if not military officers or leaders, they had um, uh, judgments at their disposal that they would deliver, okay? Uh, we, uh, we see the word used in Exodus chapter 7, verse 3, on the destruction of the wicked. We know that they could be a military leader, any, anybody know of some of the judges just offhand that would have would have fit this description? Right, Gideon, there you one. Samson, Samson the destroyer. Ehud, <laughs> one of my favorite stories in, in scripture, and it, which will tell you just how deranged I can be, uh, is the story of Ehud. We'll probably get to that next week. Um, how about Deborah and Barak? Okay, um, I, I, there was a there's a whole army that uh, sees them as destroyers and and stuff. But above all else, the judges were pictures of the need for the and, and for for a, a a fundamental need for a savior. Okay, a fundamental need for a savior. Their existence, their prominence in this book shows divine deliverance, shows divine appointment, okay? Um, so those are, those are, you know, who we're dealing with with the judges. I think it's really cool if you, uh, and I may show some of these maybe uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks, that the period of the judges, even though we don't study it very much, even though it's not talked about very much, uh, I think in, in a lot of part because we like to avoid the topic of sin, uh, but um, it's one of the most prolific eras of history for some of the Renaissance artists to turn to for their materials, okay? You know, uh, uh, the prophetess Deborah by, by Doré, uh, the blinding of Samson uh, by uh, Rembrandt, 
um, Hemskirk and Gideon thanking God for the miracle of the dew. Okay, some really, really wonderful um, uh, Renaissance and, and early Enlightenment type artwork uh, comes from this this period. So uh, artists have found tremendous inspiration uh, when in the uh, uh, content and context of, of the judges. So, uh, but um, here's a laundry list of learnings. Uh, that I think uh, we would be able to pull from the book of Judges, and there's probably several more laundry lists that you could pull. Uh, first off, we just alluded to this. Mankind requires a Savior. It doesn't deserve a Savior. It requires a Savior. It requires a Deliverer. Second point is humans naturally turn from God. Sin is corrosive. It corrupts. And it is an almost ever-present issue in our lives, in the lives of individuals, and therefore in the lives of aggregate individuals that we call nations. Sin has negative consequences. It always has negative consequences. Now, the first time I think I taught this, I said sin has consequences. Okay? Um, and I had to amend that to say sin has negative consequences. Okay? And we're going to see that repeatedly at very early chapters of, of the book of Judges. The fourth thing is the thing that I kind of hang my hat on, um, is that God is a merciful God. And his mercy repeats itself. Okay? One thing that I heard, the, the, that I heard actually a pastor teach that I, I, I vehemently disagree with um, was that uh, said that every time you sin, you re-crucify Christ. I do not subscribe to that, okay? Christ died once for all, for sins committed, for sins that will be committed, that sins are in the process of being committed. There was one provision, okay? We do not re-crucify Christ, okay? That being said, when you look at the restoration uh, the reconciliation and the mercy of God as he deals with the Israelite people, I think that makes even more manifest God's mercy. And it, to me, elevates and amplifies that verse, God sent his only son, okay? It amplifies the unbelievable, awesome redemption that occurred on the cross, and then at the resurrection, because it was once and for all. Um, humans, <laughs> humans' will, absent God's will, is pathetic and nasty. It's vicious and it's grotesque. The human will is absolutely grotesque. Humans are fundamentally incapable of solving their own problems outside of God's guidance, okay? Actually, I think Solomon tells us, he shows us this really, really well in the book of Ecclesiastes, searching wisest dude that's ever lived, that's ever going to live, and he searched it all, looking for solutions to his problems. And he comes to the realization that absent God, you cannot find that, that solvency. Each generation must pass down their knowledge of God's ways to the next. See, I believe the assault on history is a premeditated, purposeful assault to disconnect us, to disconnect our children and the next generation from the past. And we're going to look next week at seven times Seven times just in the book of Judges. And there's probably more. I mean, there's seven very clear times that we saw, we see this falling away for the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, okay? Continual falling away. But each generation has a responsibility to pass down the knowledge of God's ways to the next generation. Everyone needs solid, righteous leadership. Okay, obviously we, we have solid, righteous leadership, perfect leadership, you know, in Almighty God, but we also need solid, righteous leadership um, 
uh, from, from our own human leaders. Um, the next is God's sovereign purposes for nations and his people will not be amended. It will not be stalled. It will not be blocked. His judgment is inviolable, and it will happen. The next thing is God raises up ordinary citizens to do mighty things in his plan. Okay, Ordinary citizens, in some cases using ordinary tools, tent pegs, ox gourds, jaws of, um, of, of, of animals, Okay, I'm not sure that's ordinary. I mean, it wouldn't be ordinary to us. It'd probably be ordinary, you know, in the ancient Near East and whatnot. But ordinary citizens to do mighty things in his, in his plan, and he uses men and he uses women. Okay, and I think that's uh, I am often appalled when I'm when I've you know been confronted saying that uh, how can you be a Christian? How can you believe in in Scripture as misogynistic as it is? These are people who obviously have not re- read the book of Judges, actually have not read Scripture, okay, because just some beautiful stories of deliverers that are women. And the final thing that I think probably is the most important takeaway for me at least is there is never an efficacious compromise position with sin, okay? It's a binary thing. Okay? It's very rare that I get drawn off sides on social media. Okay? Very rare. I don't post very often on true social media. Okay? Um, but a few years ago, and I wish I could tell you exactly what this was in reference to, one of my high school um, uh, classmates, who I was very close to, and um, sadly, I guess not not much anymore, posts on this thing called Facebook, um, it truly makes me sad when people only see the world in black and white. By doing so, you are limiting yourselves from discovering the millions of grays that would only make your lives deeper, richer, more fulfilled, and pleasurable. I hate rigid thinking. I really don't, I mean, I will, t- I will share with you what my response was, was to this, and I wish Matt was here because I need to, need to ask him if this would qualify on that apologetics uh, component of gentleness, you know, in, in, in response, but someone hates rigid thinking here, um, and I, <laughs> my, my response was, it makes me sad when people only see the world in shades of gray and miss the clarities of black and white, okay? Um, luckily, I did not say I hate <laughs> um, <laughs> facetious thinking or what not, um, I got a response to that post. Do you think, I mean, you, you, would, would you think I got a response to that post? Yeah, you would think I'd got to get a response to that post, and I did. Not from my high school classmate. From her father. <laughs> who said, same Greg, funny. <laughs> um, which, I mean, I, I do find some amusement in this, okay? Uh, but, um, uh, Liking that post on hating rigid thinking um, and not seeing the world in terms of black and white, because I'll tell you right now, I see it in terms of black and white just as clear as it can be. You're either saved or you're not saved. Your eternal destiny is with Christ or it is, out, it is outside of Christ. That is it, okay? That's it. I do not see how it can be more clear than that, okay? Um, and, and I don't find obscurities... Uh, in in scripture when it comes to that but um, maybe I am the same Greg I've never been described as being funny but um, uh, that's that's what I consider modern clarity Um, so uh, I guess we should look at what are the commandments okay what what are God's clarity for the for the for the 
people of Israel as, as they enter the period of the judges. Exodus 23, 32 through 33 says, Do not make a covenant with them or with their gods. Do not let them live in your land or they will cause you to sin against me because the worship of their gods will certainly be a snare to you. Does that sound ambiguous? Doesn't sound ambiguous to me. Very, very clear. That's Exodus chapter 23, verse 32 through 33. Uh, Joshua, okay, uh, the book that precedes Judges here in, in both where it aligns in, in, the, in the order of Scripture and in history. Chapter 23, verses 9 through 13. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand. Listen, one of you routes a thousand because the, because the Lord your God fights for you, just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive them out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs, thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord God has given you. Does that sound ambiguous? Does that sound obscure? That's not. Not only does it say what must happen, it says the consequences of what will happen if it doesn't happen. And it is exceptionally clear. So, Deuteronomy, that, uh, Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 5 says, Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters or the, to, son, to their sons or take your, their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. Let's turn to Judges chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Judges chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Generally speaking, I find that sentences that begin with the word but don't end in a very good place. Okay? And my translation, which I'm reading from the Holman uh, translation, says in verse 5 of chapter 3, But they settled among the Canaanites, Hethites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. There might have been some other ites in there. The Israelites took their daughters as wives for themselves, gave their own daughters to their sons, and worshipped their gods. It only takes Three chapters, three chapters to see what happened. Were they warned? Yes. Do they know the consequences? Yes. Okay. And yet, is that obscure? Is that ambiguous? Okay. One point I'd like to make here is that um, it talks about do not intermarry with them. We see... Um, certain things, uh, you know, even in the New Testament that, that kind of amplify this. Don't intermarry, okay? Um, if, you, if you wanted to, you could make a whole study right here about the importance of the marriage covenant, okay? How seriously God takes marriage, okay? Not something that our current society uh, tends to hold in, um, in much value, but... Um, we won't spend time developing that particular doctrinal position. Uh, but we're talking now about the conquest, okay? Now, remember that the conquest, by the time you get to the judges, has already begun. Uh, Joshua has entered the promised land, um, and a lot of the territory had been, uh, we'll call it pacified, if not fully occupied. Uh, and, but I think you can tell from, from how this study is going to go that they did not do what the Lord had commanded. And therefore, there's going to be some uh, interesting consequences and interesting reconciliations. But when you're talking about the conquest and the, the destruction of the Canaanites and the driving them out and the disruption of their, of their pagan practices, uh, it's one of the most often cited parts of Scripture that
that, that folks will use to say that, that God does not exist. And you heard Matt talk about that a, a few weeks ago. Okay? We won't get too deeply into the apologetics arguments on this, uh, but um, one thing I want to make very, very clear is that 400 years prior to the period of the Judges, when God was talking to Abraham, he told him, you will occupy this land, why? Because of the righteousness of the Is Israelites? No. Because the land was given to them because of the iniquities and the sins of the Amorites that were not yet, be were not yet fulfilled. Now, I don't know what long-suffering means. For me, long-suffering might be an hour and a half. Okay, we're talking four centuries, okay, four centuries here before God brings his judgment, okay, and he, and it's, it's, it's not like it's a unique thing, I mean, there was a flood, was there not, okay, it's not like it's even unique in terms of history future, okay, there's going to be a bloodbath at the second coming of, of Jesus Christ, okay, and the nations will be destroyed before him, those that have not accepted him, people who have not accepted him. But it always comes back to, wow, that seems so harsh, okay? That seems so harsh. Well, I, I said we won't spill, spend much time in apologetics, but I will uh, quote from Clay Jones, who is a, a, a Christian apologist who teaches at Biola University. Uh, so you can see I don't just uh, draw material from, from Baptist seminaries. Um, he said, in short, most of our problems regarding God's ordering the destruction of the Canaanites and their practices come from the fact that God hates sin and we do not. That's where our problem comes from, okay? In Deuteronomy 9.5, as I alluded to earlier, it's not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you're going to take possession of the land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Okay? No real difference here in the judgment of sin than what you see uh, when the Babylonians come and exile and rout and kill. Okay? Um, it's just anathema to us because we don't hate sin as much as God hates sin. Okay? Um, my... Um, I guess my second level, level supervisor graduated from West Point, and we were playing a game um, at the early uh, parts of the COVID lockdown where we were having to give our uh, a, a favorite quotation, and then people would guess whose favorite quotation that was. Now, like I mentioned, my, my second level supervisor graduated from West Point, and he, um, he had, his quotation was from Douglas MacArthur, okay? This should surprise nobody, but it surprised a whole lot of people. And you know why? They had no idea who General Douglas MacArthur was, okay? So I played a game with my own sales team. I said, well, he's obviously a general, okay? So that probably means he has something to do with combat or war, okay? So which war did um, Douglas MacArthur, is he most commonly associated with? Care to guess what a majority of my own sales team tells me? Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah, the only one. I mean, I, I, I was just glad they, they didn't say, yeah, oh, yeah, um, that one in Iraq or Iran or, 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 or wherever. They didn't say that one. But the majority thought it was Vietnam. Um, close second, the Civil War. Okay? Um, can we split the difference just a little bit here and maybe get, you know, get into world? But I do have one, I had one of my sales team nailed it, okay? He nailed it. And you know why he nailed it? He's from the Philippines. He's Filipino. He loves Douglas MacArthur, <laughs> okay? I can tell you. Uh, he loves Douglas MacArthur. But I'll quote from Douglas MacArthur. In this day of gathering storms, as moral deterioration of political power, spreads its growing infection. <laughs> you think he's alive today? It is essential that every spiritual force be mobilized to defend and preserve the religious base upon which this nation is founded. 
For it has been that base which has been the motivating impulse to our moral and national growth. History fails to record a single precedent in which nations subject to moral decay have not passed into political and economic decline. There has been either a spiritual reawakening to overcome the moral lapse or a progressive deterioration leading to ultimate national disaster. Touched a nerve? <laughs> Douglas MacArthur, okay? By the way, that's a few decades ago. Think his word takes on uh, any more meaning uh, today? Probably so. So this actually puts me in an advantageous position because I just have a very few minutes, and I really don't like to spend, the, spend much time talking about this, but I'll go, I'll go through this because people don't truly understand it. How wicked were the Canaanites? Just how wicked were the Canaanite people? Well, obviously, they were into idolatry, okay? Um, but Canaanite polytheism didn't stop at multi-god worship. It intentionally and progressively degraded Almighty God by awful substitution. It wasn't just sync syncretic. It wasn't just blending everything in. Olf Oldenburg from the University of Chicago wrote in 1969, by the time of the Hebrew Exodus, Baal had already uh, usurped El's power in Canaan. Now, who would El be? El Shaddai, El Elyon, okay? Baal had already surpassed El's, or Baal had already surpassed El's power in Canaan. When the Canaanite religion, El lost the dynamic strength expressed to him in his name, he lost himself. Most Ugaritic texts describe him as a poor weakling, a coward who abandons justice to save his skin, the contempt of goddesses. One text depicts El as a drunkard splashing in his excrement and urine after a banquet. It's not just that they decided we're going to have other gods. It's that they proactively went out and defamed Almighty God. Not a recipe for national health. Incest. Early Canaanite laws pro prohibited incest by death or banishment. Oh, that doesn't sound so bad. But by the 14th century... The penalties had been reduced to a civil offense payable by a modest fine. The Canaanite pantheon of gods was completely incestuous, and these are the people, these are the so-called gods that they worship. And all you need to do is look at Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? Okay, look at Sodom and Gomorrah. We know what was happening there, but it didn't stop there. I mean, the smoke had not cleared over Sodom and Gomorrah before Lot's daughters did something. What did they do? Incest with their father, and from that lineage came the Moabites, the Ammonites, right? Which is one of the reasons why Balak should not have feared the Israelites because of the relationship uh, there. They've been told not to, to mess with them. What about adultery? Well, come on. The Canaanite religion was a fertility religion. Worship practices were often performed naked, by temple priests and priestesses, priestesses engaged in sexual acts. Adultery would have been against the law in most of the ancient Near East, but only for the married woman, not for anybody else. Child sacrifice. Leviticus 18.21 says, Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your God, I am Lord. John Day, in his book, Molech, A God of Human Sacrifice in the Old Testament, published in 1989, says it was not just unwanted children who were sacrificed. Plutarch reports that during the Phoenician Canaanite sacrifices, the whole area before the statue was filled with loud noises of flutes and drums so that the cries of the wailing should not reach the ears of the people. Homosexuality. There's absolutely no text that has been found from the ancient Near East from this time period that condemns that practice. In fact, there's much more evidence, well, there's actually evidence, that it was common practice as a part of their worship. From Stephanie Daly's Era in Isham 4, Oxford, they rouse Iana, the party boys and the festival people who changed their masculinity into femininity to make people of Ishtar revere her. 
transvestism, homosexuality, and Sodom and Gomorrah actually proves this was not just between, quote, consenting adults. So just how wicked were these Canaanite people? Bestiality. The Hittite Law 199 says, If anyone lies with a pig or dog, he shall die. If a man lies with a horse or mule, there is no punishment. The Canaanite god himself of Baal practiced bestiality. And there's no prohibition against bestiology in the rest of the ancient Near East, and it was also a practice used during worship. So I got through that in four minutes. At this point, I would usually say any questions, comments. I really don't wish any uh, at, at, at this point. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, four, four minutes is long-suffering in this case. Um, we will pick up next week with our rap sheet. We'll look at our rap sheet because it's um, pretty interesting. The same fellow I quoted a few minutes ago, Clay Jones from, um, from Biola University, says, it's led me to wonder if the Canaanites today might not stand up in judgment and condemn this generation. Okay? So we'll, we'll start there. Then we'll look at how the Israelites got themselves into this pickle. Um, that they, they got themselves in. We'll start to look at the seven cycles that we see very quickly um, and then um, see where we want to go from there as to whether or not we want to look at the epilogues um, because the, the, last, uh, the last section of the book of Judges uh, is just unreal and serves as a, a very poignant example of what sin does to a nation. So aside from all those other things that ended in alities, um, any questions, comments, um, <laughs> grievances? Um, sure. There's no doubt about that. Um, in fact, you're hitting on one of the things that I'm researching right now. I, I really want to go back to even the Tower of Babel and look at the power of language. Uh, but, I mean, you know, you, you trace it up here, you, 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 start, you think they had warnings and, and didn't heed them? Have we not read the book 1984? <laughs> and he who controls the language and he who controls history controls? Okay, so you're exactly right. Language has changed. Okay. Brennan, Douglas MacArthur, what, uh, what war was he associated with? Thank you. Very good. You could pass that down onto the next generations, people. They might be, you know, might be something helpful. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious heavenly. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yes, the, of course, the Spanish American War. Very nice. <laughs> Very good. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious heavenly Father, we we thank you for the Word of God that you've given us, um, both the incarnate Word, Lord, and the inspired Word. beyond all human understanding uh, for us to, to have received Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. How much more manifest and amplified our own purpose and mission is in the furtherance of your kingdom here, Lord. Lord, we pray a special blessing on the, the, the message and the, and the song service that will follow. May it touch our hearts and inspire us uh, to be more of a light into this dark world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.